makes our joy complete. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others. For the harm we have caused, known and unknown, forgive us. For the unjust demands we place on others and your creation, forgive us. For the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor, forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. And in Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit to be with you all.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Beloved God, from you come all things that are good. Lead us by the inspiration of your spirit to know these things that are right. And by your merciful guidance, help us to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. morning. The first reading is from Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. <clears throat> and now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, it did why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make, a wa I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. <clears throat> he expected justice, but he saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Send this vine 
preserve your right and has planned. Look down from heaven, O oh God, behold an mine. <clears throat> the second reading is from Philippians 3. Paul writes, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a prosecutor of the church, as a righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus had made me his own, beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But this one thing I do, Forgetting what lies beyond and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. <laughs> Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning in the 21st chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, you, O Lord. Jesus said to the people, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take and get his inheritance. So they seized him threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death, death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken.
taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. Well, kids, I have some bad news for you. I was in Lowe's a little bit more than a week ago. They had their Christmas trees out. And I got a catalog from Amazon, a toy catalog. It was September. So you know what that means, don't you? That means if you ask for anything... Your parents or your grandparents can tell you, well, you be good, and maybe Santa will bring it for you at Christmas. It's three months until Christmas. When I was a kid, shoot, we only had to be good for about a month. (laughs) But there's a bright side to this, another side to this. There's a gift that you can get right now and always. And that's the gift of God's grace and God's love. We just heard a a reading from the Bible. It was the the Apostle Paul. Paul explained that, well, in order to be close to God, I had to follow all these rules all the time. I had to do things a certain way. I had to be good all the time. But because he had a personal relationship with Jesus... It wasn't like he didn't want to follow the rules anymore, but then the rules became less important. What became more important was his faith and his love for God. It became much more personal. So that's what's available to you. This gift of God's grace and God's love is available to you right now. You don't have to wait for the catalog. You don't have to be good for anybody. Still be good, but you don't have to be good to get God's love. So it's, it's always available. It's always a wonderful gift for you. So let's have a brief prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of your grace and your love. We hope that we can always accept them each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Each week after I read the gospel, I say the words, the gospel of our Lord. And you reply with, thanks be to God, right? Tell me what is the response. Say it louder. Thank you. Thank you. Today, as I said that, and as we engaged in that interaction, I have to say, where is the gospel in this parable? Where is the good news? It's destruction. It's violence. Where is it? Is there any in this gospel? So I thought, well, Let's start with a summary. A landowner planted a vineyard, rented it out, and entrusting his property to tenants, he left town. What could go wrong with that, right? Being gone for a long time, the harvest arrives, and that absentee landowner sent his servants to collect the first fruits. The tenants were mistreated and abused and killed, or the tenants mistreated, abused, and killed everyone that the landowner sent. Now, when you have landowners and tenants, you have this lease agreement. 
It's a legally binding contract between a landlord and a tenant. And it outlines the terms of the lease. So I have to wonder how smart this landowner might be when they decide that sending their son will get the desired results. Because after all, the son has the authority of the father. And yet, once again, we hear of the violence that the tenants throw the son out of the vineyard and then they kill him. All of my life, I have heard and understood this gospel in light of the many sermons that I have heard telling me that these tenants are wicked and that when the son returns the second time, he will take the vineyard away from these wicked tenants and will put them to death. And then he will rent out the vineyard to other tenants who will fulfill the contract that's been agreed upon. Even today, in sanctuaries and pulpits throughout our nation, most preachers will convey the same story and the same results. Interpreting this parable through a lens that is fear-based. If you don't, then God will take it away. But look closely at this text. And I say that not realizing that the text isn't in your bulletin. So uh, if you have a Bible app or something and you want to look it up, or you have your Bible with you, look it up. But if you look closely at the text, Jesus tells this parable, and then... He asks in verse 40, Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Jesus is asking that question. Now before we go on, I need to add some background here. In chapter 21, it began with Jesus sending his disciples to find a donkey. Do you remember where that comes from? He will enter Jerusalem on that donkey. And we know that this triumphal entry into Jerusalem takes us back to Palm Sunday. The people spreading cloaks along the path and waving palm branches are shouting Hosanna to the son of David as he enters the city. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And after arriving in Jerusalem, he overturns the tables in the temple. This causes the chief priests and the elders of the people to question Jesus' authority. And our pericope for today is the second of three parables that Jesus uses in response to the chief priests and the elders. The first one was last week's gospel. Two sons who choose to do the will of the father. Today the absentee landlord and the wicked tenants will say. And next week's parable of the wedding banquet. That everyone is too busy to attend. And the guest who is not properly robed. All three of these parables are spoken in succession. And they point out the sharply drawn division between Jesus' ministry and the leaders of the Jewish people. The sad irony in all of this is that it is told by Jesus, this story, this parable is told by Jesus just five days before he himself is thrown out of the city and killed. Peter Lang writes in his sermon on this text from 2008, yes, I have old resources. Our Lord's imminent death, resurrection, and sending of the Spirit at Pentecost, when the owner of the vineyard returns, are important for understanding Jesus' words in these parables to the Jewish leaders. So now that you have the background, Jesus tells this parable and then in verse 40 he asks, now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And I was surprised and amazed actually to hear the reply. 
they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. They said it. The Jewish leaders, the chief priests, and the elders say this. Jesus does not say this. Jesus does not judge them. The Jewish leaders condemn themselves. Just to be clear here, Jesus does not talk about death and destruction here. We, we want to put the severity and the punishment on God as if God accomplishes God's will by our human standards. Recall the Old Testament use of an eye for an eye. Just like the story from the Old Testament in Isaiah. God does not deal with us, my friends, in human terms or in human principles. So I am struck by Jesus' response to them. Jesus says to them, Have you not read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. He's quoting the 118th Psalm there. But Jesus does not talk about destroying. He doesn't talk about annihilation. Instead, he talks about the kingdom of God will be given to a people who will produce fruit. So that got me thinking, what is the fruit of the kingdom? And you know this. You know how I know you know this? Because we've been talking about it for the last year. It has come up before. The fruit of the vineyard is repentance and faith, along with the love of God and the love of neighbor, which faith produces, I might add. So other words that have been used throughout this year by me include obedience and relationship and justice and extravagant grace and mercy. All of that is the fruit of the vineyard. St. Paul says it this way when he writes in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Each characteristic is given to each one to be used to build up the kingdom of God. And the gospel writer in the gospel of John, chapter 15, says it this way. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So bearing fruit, my friends, means that Christ abides in our lives and we experience the life and the love of Christ flowing through us, into us, and through us to our neighbors. J.I. Packer and Carolyn Nystrom in their book titled Abiding in Christ writes it this way. Abide is an old English word meaning to remain, to sit with, to stay steady, and to keep your position. What it means, what it means to abide in Christ is that we are always to be resting on him anchored to him, fixed in him, drawing from him, continually connected and in touch with him. There is no more precious lesson to learn, no more encircling link and bond to cherish, no more vital connection to keep snug and tight so that it never loosens than this. Abiding in Christ brings joy and peace and love, answers our prayer and gives and provides fruitfulness in our service. The abiding life is the abundant life. So while the leaders of Israel would pronounce murder or annihilation on fellow human beings, Jesus simply says the kingdom of God will be given to people who will produce the fruit of righteousness and obedience. Over the years, many have argued that this text is proof that Israel's leaders were meant to guide God's chosen people to obedience and righteousness and that they had failed and they had rejected God's uh, prophetic messengers, including God's son, Jesus, the Messiah, 
And because of their failures, then they lose the role of tending the vineyard of God's people on earth. Then God's relationship with humanity moved from Israel to the church for that reason, many proclaim. But perhaps that same view today needs to be considered and looked at from a different angle, that the church today stands where the Jewish leaders were during Jesus' day, and they, the church, is at risk of losing the role of tending the vineyard of God's people on earth. That really sounds like law to me, and yet it is something we need to look at. But when Jesus identifies himself as a stone rejected by the builders but chosen by the Lord to be the cornerstone, and he talks about falling over the stone and being crushed by this stone, I had to figure out why Jesus still did not go to that violence and that aggression that us humans tend to go to. And I learned this. Cornerstones in biblical times connected two walls. This stone was the most important stone of the foundation of any building, and it would be placed in a visible corner. It would set the angle and the level and the outer dimensions of the building. It had to be level, it had to be squared true and vertical, so that all the other future stones could be set from it. Once it was in place, the rest of the building would conform to the angles and to the size of the cornerstone. If removed, the entire structure could collapse. It was the most costly stone also because of its beauty and its strength. Typically, it was the largest, most solid, and carefully constructed stone. So by using the cornerstone image to describe himself, Jesus was declaring that the church would be built upon what the prophet Isaiah foretold in chapter 28. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, see I am laying in Zion a foundation stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. So in summary, Jesus, God sent Jesus to save the vineyard and its tenants, and God was very faithful in sending Jesus, and Jesus fulfilled his vocation and his mission. Jesus sought and saved, according to Matthew, what we've been reading, the last in Matthew 20, so the last will be first and the first will be last, the least, the king will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me, in Matthew 25. And the lost, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, from Matthew 18. So Jesus, in seeking those he loved, the last, the least, and the lost, was cast out and rejected and killed. And God raised him from the dead and placed him as the cornerstone of his church. <sighs> Friends, we are in God's vineyard. And we are there by grace. Nourished to produce fruit through word and through sacrament. Second, the second chapter of, of St. Peter reminds us that the cornerstone, the rock, desires we become living stones. In other words, tenants who bear fruit. And built upon the cornerstone, we are transformed into a holy priesthood. Ah, wow, I feel really better now because actually I'm quite a bit overjoyed. And I'm delighted and I'm thrilled for in this moment, at this time... I can clearly say, this is the gospel of our Lord. Amen.
us profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church and for all who have any need. God of grace, you are the source of life and joy. Strengthen the resolve of your church throughout the world, that together we may press on toward the goal of your heavenly call, that is through Christ Jesus. God of grace, God of all creation, you plant and nourish the earth as your own precious vineyard. Bless fields and orchards and the hands of those who labor in them that your people are fed with an abundant harvest of good fruit. God of grace, God of all the earth, you desire peace and justice between nations and peoples. Guide leaders of nations and states and provinces and cities that they faithfully govern your people with wisdom, integrity, and compassion. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all compassion, in Christ you lovingly pour yourself out like wine for your people. Have mercy on all who mourn, all who struggle with their mental health, all who cry out for justice, all who hunger, and all in any need. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all steadfastness, you set Christ as the cornerstone and the foundation of the church. Build up this congregation as living stones, that it may stand in the community as a witness to your enduring faithfulness and love. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of all hope, the saints who come before us lived and died with their hearts fixed upon you. We give you thanks for their faithful witness, and we wait with hope for the great day when we join their voices in praise. God of grace, hear our prayer. Glorious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and your amazing grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
Let us pray. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. And we bring your gifts to this table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. give you thanks. Father, through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, whom you sent in this end of the ages to save and to redeem us and to proclaim to us your will. He is your word, inseparable from you, and through him you created all things, and in him you take delight. He is your word, sent, to, sent from heaven to a virgin's womb, where he there took on our nature and our lot, and was shown forth as your Son, born of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary. It is he, our Lord Jesus, who fulfilled all your will and won for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands in suffering in order to free from suffering those who trust you. It is he who handed over to a death he freely accepted in order to destroy death, to break the bonds of the evil one and to crush hell underfoot, to give light to the righteous and to establish his covenant to show forth the resurrection. Taking bread and giving thanks to you said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This is my blood poured out for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering then his death and his resurrection, we lift this bread and this cup before you, giving you thanks that you have made us worthy to stand before you and to serve you as your priestly people. And we ask you, Send your spirit upon these gifts of your church. Gather into one all who share this bread and wine. Fill us with your Holy Spirit to establish our faith in truth, that we may praise and may glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. For through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. with confidence in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites you to this table. Come, eat, live.
rise. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word. Christ Jesus, the joy and the delight of our hearts, strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, where no one will be left out and all will be satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The God of glory, Jesus Christ, the name above all names, and the Spirit who lives in you, bless you now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Till Linda gets up here, I'll start with the announcements. If you're not aware of it, Martha's um, mother died on, Thursday, or, uh, on Friday, and her service will be on Thursday, I believe. Is it at Brown's, Cherry? It'll be at Brown's. So you, at 11 o'clock on Thursday. Um, also, um, uh, I am not in the office Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but you can reach me by phone, which simply means that with Martha being out and my not being here, there's no one in the office this week. So um, just reach out to me if you need anything or to Linda if you need something Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Sorry, Linda. No problem. And the rest of the announcements. Wednesday will be Bible study at 12.30. Thursday at 6.30 will be the rebuild, which will be at the community coffee shop from 6.30 to 8. And it's for those that are deconstructing, having questions, join us on Thursday. Um, next Sunday is service at 10 a.m. The Christian Life is a course about Christian faith and how God connects with our lives is being offered by pastor. Classes are 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. The dates are October 17th, 24th, 31st, November 7th, 14th, and 21st. They are in the pastor's office in Lucas Hall. The first Wednesday club, we're having a Halloween party on Wednesday the 18th at 2 p.m. You can come costumed or not, whichever you wish. Bring a munchie to share and we will prove be providing drinks. Please come and bring friends if you want to. We have a, we usually have a really good time at our things. Any, pardon? Always. We always have a good time. And why haven't you been there? <laughs> I know. Anyway. <laughs> Does anyone else have any announcements? It's on King Street, isn't it? What's that? We're the community coffee shop. It's literally across the block, but you have to go around. You can't go through the wall back there at the parking lot. It's on King Street. So if you just go down to the oh, alley and around. What's that street? Burke. 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 Burke Street. Okay. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Have a good day.
Go in peace. God is at work in you. Thanks be to God.